Emmanuel. God with us. Power, prestige, influence. These are not concepts that we commonly associate with being personable. In our world today, when we think of politicians, public figures, celebrities, people of great influence, these are not often people that we associate with being among us, with the everyday people, people that we encounter on a daily basis. And we live in a democratic society where the rulers, politicians, the powers are chosen from among the people. In the ancient Near Eastern world, in the region of Israel, the place where the first Christmas took place 2,000 years ago, rulers, kings, authorities, they were even less accessible than they are today. Distant, austere, clinical people, not of the people. In fact, in, those, in that ancient Near Eastern world, the, the powers, the kings, the rulers, the authorities... They were people that would look down their noses at the common people. To have had an audience with a king would have been an incredible, exceptional thing. This was the environment into which hope came down that first Christmas time. I haven't met a lot of famous and influential or powerful people. I met the former prime minister once, but that was before he was prime minister. My wife... Annabelle, she's met some famous people. She's, she met the current Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Of course, that was before he was Prime Minister too. But my wife has also had the opportunity of meeting the reigning monarch, the Queen of England, Queen Elizabeth. So I'm kind of stealing her story here. And if you want the, the real and thorough account, you'll have to talk to her sometime. But when she was in grade school, my wife Annabelle was invited with her school to an event where Queen Elizabeth was present. And while she was there, Annabelle got to meet the queen. Then several years later, as a, as a young woman, Annabelle again went to an event, a church event, where, again, the queen was there, and she got to meet Queen Elizabeth for a second time. And it was interesting because that second time, there was a glint in the queen's eye, a look of familiarity, almost as if the queen recognized Annabelle, that she had seen her before. Certainly in the ancient world, a ruler would never remember having met someone from among the population. They were very distant, very far away. Yet again, it was into this context in the ancient world that hope came down. There's a passage of Scripture from John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. It says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Who here can name one being that at any point in its life, or at no point in its life, was not dependent upon some other being for its existence? If you think about it, whether it's a person who's born, at some point in a person's life they're dependent upon a mother, father, a guardian, whether it's an animal, again, dependent upon its mother at some point, or even dependent upon the living plant that it ingests. We cannot name one being that at no point in its life is not dependent upon some other being for its existence. No other being except for one, God. God is not dependent upon any other being for his existence. God always was. God is. And in fact, even in the, the beautiful communion of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, God didn't even need someone to talk to because the communion of the Trinity was so fulfilled in and of itself. And yet, because of His creative genius, because of His desire to create, that being, God, created humanity, created us each and every one of us. At Christmas time, we celebrate Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus, who descended to be with us. Jesus was not created. Although at Christmas time, we celebrate Jesus being born, 
God the Son always was and always is. At Christmas time, we celebrate God incarnate coming to be among us. Can you imagine with me in that ancient world where rulers were distant, clinical, austere, that the King of Kings came in that most vulnerable form. The God that was not dependent upon any other being for His existence came in the form of a baby. God incarnate. The King of Kings, but also the Creator of everything that is. And in that moment, that vulnerable moment, the Creator of all that exists was dependent upon a mother for His sustenance. That's how much God loves you. That He would humble Himself to the point being a vulnerable baby, being a vulnerable child. Jesus, the Word, that which comes from God to fulfill His purpose in us before the world. Jesus, the Word, God speaking to us through Jesus Christ revealed in the form of a baby. Verse 18 of the passage continues, No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is Himself God, and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made Him known. God could have left it that way, but He didn't. He did something unthinkable. God the Son left heaven to come to earth. He became among us. Maybe you've met some famous people. Maybe you've met some influential, powerful people. More than I have. More than Annabelle has. But at Christmas time, we celebrate God, the King of Kings. Creator of all existence, far and above any ruler, any famous person, incarnate. Come in the form of a child, Jesus. Jesus who can be known. Jesus who the Word reveals Himself to us. Jesus who is with us. Not distant, not far away, not unaware of the challenges that we all face. That is Emmanuel, God with us. He is with you. He is with me. He can be known. Will you know him today? Everybody stand for just a minute. If you're here with somebody that you're related to, would you hold their hand? Just take their hand for a minute. Would you do that? Well, I tell you this little story. Okay, here we go. A family went on a camping trip and the dad decided to go for a walk. His young daughter stated her desire to walk with him, and in the course of their journey, they came to a small gorge with a short wooden bridge spanning the gorge. The little girl was very nervous about crossing the bridge, so the dad said she could hold his hand if she wanted to. She instantly replied she did not want to hold his hand, but wanted him to hold hers. And he said to her, what's the difference? And she said, oh, daddy, there's a big difference. If I hold your hand, I might let go. If you hold my hand, you will never let go. You may be seated. John chapter 1 verse 4 says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The little word was, Aaron has already dealt with it, but the reality is Jesus is God. The little word was talks about this eternal reality of God. I'm sure you know this, but there's some things God cannot do. Right? So God cannot lie. Isn't that good news? Aren't you glad that God can't lie? Wow. God cannot sin. I can tell you're really impressed with this. This is amazing, folks. God can never be guilty of any sin at all. Hmm. God cannot change. That's amazing. Think about it now. He could never get better because if he got better, he wouldn't be God now. And he could never get worse because if he got worse, he'd be less than God. God can never change. God can never cease to exist. You do understand that God is omnipresent, right? He's not like some giant elastic man. He's just omnipresent. The entirety of the being of God fills the universe. Emmanuel, God with us, yes. See, here's the deal. The only way God could not fill the universe with the entirety of his being would be for the universe to cease to exist because God can never cease to exist. And whatever is and wherever it is, God is there. 
And when we're talking about this Jesus, this incarnate Christ, this Emmanuel, that's who we're talking about. And that's why John says, in him was life. Life of his own, eternal life, forever life. Life that he owns and will always own. He's life itself. And the problem is that the world he created that he loves, and you and I are the star of that creation, of all of his creation, we're the only part of creation made in his image, made in his likeness. But sin had kind of messed that up a little bit, kind of marred that, made it not really very good. And so this life on that first Christmas came to our world so he could be a light to us, so that all of us could know him, so that this life could come and just shine. One author put it this way, God shines his light on us in the person of Jesus. Emmanuel, God with us, so we can understand that God wants us to see the light, and in seeing the light, have the life of God in us. And so for every one of us here today, if you're a follower of Jesus, there was a moment when the light went on, and you just understood, wow. Jesus really is the Son of God. Wow, Jesus really is the Savior. Wow, Jesus really is Emmanuel. Wow, Jesus really is with us. How many of you remember that moment? Would you just pause for 30 seconds and just say thank you? Thank you, God, for letting the light go on in us. Thank you, God, for letting us know that you're alive, that, you're, that you are God and you love us and care for us. Thank you, God for cleansing us from our sins. Thank you for the light. You see, in that God takes up residence in us. Do you, know, do you know what I love about God? I love this so much about him. Do you, do you, I'm gonna, this is a chance, though, man. This is a really good chance for you to get your hand up really quick. Just okay, you ready? Here we go. How many of you were in love? I wanted every man to have a head start. See, let's try it again. How many of you were in love? So here's the real question. Who, who made the first move? <laughs> I, mean, I made the first move in our relationship, I can tell you that. Huh. Another story for another day. So here's this, here's this God who is so filled with life. And the Bible says that he sent his son so he could be the light of the world, so the light would go on in us, so that not only will we know that he is life, but we would have his life within us. Emmanuel, life, God's life in us, within us. And God always makes the first move. Because, see, we were in darkness and we didn't even want the light. We didn't understand that God was life. So God comes to us and makes this amazing first move move. We love him because he first loved us. And when the light goes on, he gives us this incredible privilege of walking with him and knowing him, having him within us, and we get to actually walk in the light. To walk in the light means that we, that we have our lives in the light of God, live our lives in the light of God's love. To walk in the light means his commands, his will matter to us. To walk in his light means he comes and gives us of his best. To walk in his light means we have spiritual and moral fiber in our lives. To walk in his light means we live in a relationship with the living God where his presence is with us and in us. To walk in the light means that God protects us and guides us. Here's the amazing thing, folks. If you know this life in God and the life to shine in your heart and God is within you and you walk in the light, God will never let go of your hand. God will never let go of your hand. Huh. Light looked down and beheld darkness. Thither will I go, said light. Peace looked down and beheld war. Thither will I go, said peace. Love looked down and beheld hatred. Thither will I go, said love. So came light and shone. So came peace and gave rest. So came love and brought life. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. His name is Emmanuel, God with us and God within us. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning on that first day. Don't, don't, don't you love the seasons in Canada? 
Well, about 10 of you did. Are the rest of you awake yet? I'm sure you are. See, but I, don't you love day and night as well? I mean, there's something amazing about the sunshine, don't you think? How many morning people do we have here? So you see all kinds of sunrises. After 51 years, I got away with a lot of stuff. My wife is convinced the reason she's not a morning person, the reason why God made sunsets is for all the people who have no desire or intention to see a sunrise. <laughs> for all the non-morning people, I'm getting a little affirmation there. So, But there's something amazing about the light coming up in the morning and dispelling the darkness, isn't there? But there's something powerful about the night as well. We have a place in the north, and I just love a full moon. It was one not long ago, and there's enough snow on the ground up there, and you can actually see to walk in the woods because the light, just the moonlight, just dispels the darkness in them. Beautiful darkness, beautiful, beautiful. But you see, not everybody likes the dark. There's a lot of phobias in our world. Phobias are just fear of things. There's so many phobias, there's actually a phobia phobia. And that's a fear of having phobias or a fear of having fears. All kinds of people are afraid. They're afraid of snakes and they're afraid of spiders and closed spaces and heights and wide open spaces and on and on. There's a phobia called nyctophobia, and that's actually a fear of the dark. And John tells us in chapter 1, verse 5, that maybe there should be a little fear of the dark. Now, the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. The Bible actually describes a number of different kinds of darkness. It's a darkness that uh, talks just about shadow. There's the darkness that comes with gloom. There's the normal darkness that comes with day and night. And there's a moral darkness where people kind of lose sight of who God, who God is or, or don't know him at all. And not, not everybody in that world is a bad person. They just don't know God, and so they're lost. And so there's a spiritual darkness. And God uses darkness as a metaphor in John here for, for not knowing God, for having this, 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 this lostness. And so in verse 4, we actually see God invading the darkness. That's God's side. But in, chapter, in verse 5, he sees it from man's side where we're living in darkness and the darkness has invaded and invaded our world. And the good news is in that Emmanuel, God with us, and God in us, and God for us, this Jesus, the light comes and shines into the darkness. And so God uses light as a metaphor of invading the darkness of a lost world and invading your life and invading mine and coming to us and letting us know that he actually loves us. And here's the amazing thing, folks. On that first Christmas day, Christ invaded our world with love and life and light. And wherever he shines, darkness is dispelled. It just disappears. It's just amazing. Light overcomes darkness all the time. And here's the really good news. Man, I love this. His light still shines. Aren't you glad of that? I've got people in my life who still live in the darkness. I'm glad his light still shines. And over the years, we watched them one by one come to a living faith in the God who is life and light and love. And we see the darkness to spell. Is that our that, folks? Listen, when you got, became a believer, when the light shone in your life and life entered your life, was that not an amazing moment? But is it not even almost more amazing when you watch God do that with somebody else? Because <laughs> you know all that's coming and how great that is. And the life invades. The light still shines. And the good news of Jesus is his light will never go out. Ever, ever, ever. Hmm. I actually love this. You see, the light and darkness are not opposites, really. Darkness is nothing more than the absence of light. Because Jesus is the Son of God. Wherever his light shines, no matter how bad a person is, the light can dispel the darkness. One of the things I've always loved about the kingdom is watching God save people that all of us knew were too bad to be saved. Nobody's too bad to be saved in God because the light dispels the darkness. John tells us there's a group of people, the darkness has not understood the light at all. They're not even really interested in it. Sometimes, sometimes the darkness can be really evil, bad people, but sometimes it's just ordinary people that the light hasn't shone and yet you haven't figured it out yet. It's an interesting darkness, folks. You see, no matter, no matter how dark the physical world gets, there's always some light. It's never completely dark. The only way you get complete dark in our world is you actually have to go down in a cave and close the door or close the gates so you can't, there's no dark, no light at all. 
But, but in this kind of darkness, sometimes the darkness is absolute. It's absolute. But when the sun comes up, when the sun of God shines in those hearts, the darkness is dispelled. One of the sad epitaphs in our world is this. So nyctophobia is the fear of the dark. There's another fear, another phobia. is called uh, heliophobia, and that's the fear of the light. And isn't it frightening that there are more people in our world and some people in our world who are more afraid of the darkness and more afraid than they are of the light? But there's a lot of people in our world who are more afraid of the light than they are of the darkness. And somehow we need to pray that God will invade people's hearts and lives, that the God who is with us and the God who is with us, within us, that that God will invade that darkness and that God will come to them and let them lose their fear of whatever they think God might be or not be so that the light can shine so that the darkness can absolutely disappear. F. Westcott said this, It is the essence of light to invade the realm of darkness. And that's what Jesus does. Jesus comes by his Holy Spirit, and that's what the church does. God empowers us, and collectively and individually, that's what we do by witness. And every time we have a service, and every time we declare God, and every time we share our faith, and every time we pray for somebody, and every time we love somebody, every time we reach out to somebody, that's light invading darkness. Every time. Don't minimize what your light does, folks. Please don't do that. Don't minimize how important you are to the kingdom. Don't minimize how much the light shines through you individually and us collectively as the body of Jesus. We've given you a candle as, a, as you come in, so why don't you take that out now? And you can light it if you'd like. See, darkness and light continue to coexist in our world. And as long as there is darkness, those who have seen the light must continue to shine as a reflection of that light. So back in Genesis, God put the moon in the sky at night, and the sun in the sky for us in the day. The sun's always in the sky. And you do understand the difference between the sun and the moon, right? So the sun has light in itself. The sun is a burning orb. It always has light. It is light in itself. But the moon is no light in itself at all. None. See, the moon only reflects the light of the sun. And while the earth turns and we, we in our part of the world turn away from the sun, so the sun is on the other side of the world. We call that night. We call that dark. We look at the sky and we see the moon, that all the moon is doing is reflecting the light from the sun on the other side of the world. You see, and that's what God says about us, that the light is with us because we have no natural light in ourselves either. We were living in darkness like everyone else. We actually love the darkness sometimes. But somehow Jesus came in the light of God and brings us light and life and love. And when he comes, he lights up our lives, and we have no real spiritual light of our own. But what God does, he comes and he lights his light in us. And you and I become a reflection of the light of God. We reflect him. I love this. Isaiah says it, and Matthew repeats it. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. I love John's writing. Because you see, in John, there is no guesswork in how the story would end. In John's story, he knows that the light of Jesus is so powerful that it overcomes the darkness always. And this light would continue to shine so that as long as there's someone in darkness... The light will shine to them and for them. It does it through us. So you and I reflect the light of God in our world. We reflect the light that's in us, the light of God that has come to dispel the darkness. Hmm. Do you want to hold your candle up for a minute? So here's what I know. 
The light that he shines, shines brighter than all of these candles. Aren't you glad of that? And the light that he shines, shines differently than these candles. Because see, these candles shine light on the outside. But the Son of God shines light on the inside. And from the inside out, he makes every one of us to be new creatures, new creations in his sight. And he takes every one of us and he causes us to be light bearers in his name. You and I are the light of the world because he is the light of the world in us. We're going to sing Silent Night here in a minute. But let me just say to you that if you're here today and you're holding this light and you don't happen to have a personal relationship with this life and light and love, if you don't know him at all, this light you're holding is light on the outside. But for all of us, he's inviting us to know the light on the inside that transforms our lives forever and ever and ever, which is the reason why Emmanuel came in the first place. It's the reason why there was a Christmas. And so as we sing this song, it will be a great moment for all of us to thank God for the light that has shined in our hearts and dispelled the darkness. And if you're here and you don't know him, it would be a great moment to ask that Son of God, the light of the world, to shine in your heart and dispel the darkness.